stage as before. So they went into the Jordan, sat there with the ark, while all of the tribes of Israel went across, and the water was stopped. And then as soon as they got out, the water started to flow again. Well, I thought that's interesting because one evidence of gravitational effect would be to stop the course of water. But what blew my mind is what comes next, at the end of that chapter. For the Lord your God, they're talking about the ark, dried up the Jordan before you until you had crossed over. The Lord your God did to the Jordan just what had been done to the Red Sea when he dried up before us, when he dried it up in before us until we had crossed over. Wow. That has been omitted. Because this says that they used the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord to open the Red Sea. With Moses but in the section where they talk about opening the Red Sea they just say Moses lift up his staff and open his arm and the Red Sea opened they forgot to mention that the ark was involved with this staff and so here they do though here they make it very obvious that they actually the power of the ark was open was used to open the Red Sea. That means the ark was not the box that was built at the foot of Mount Sinai after opening the Red Sea. The power of the ark had to be there with Moses before he crossed the Red Sea. And thus it was something else. The box was only something to carry it across the desert for 40 years. Probably he didn't have time to take the box out when he left Egypt. He just took the crystal. <laughs> Go ahead. Do you think Ethiopia has the Ark of the Covenant now? I'm going to get to that. So, um, are you guys all following this? Yes. Okay. Uh, so I was like, I was really excited. I was like, oh my God, this, this is really real. I mean, they, they're really talking about some object. And um, this is kind of tough to do. With this, But uh, we can, you know, I started to look into it and I found more and more evidence that the sun, that the, that the, that the ark was, um, was this crystalline structure. I found the Ezekiel text. I found the, the um, the keys of Enoch text, and I thought, and I thought, wait a minute, you know, what are they talking about? Well, I looked deeper into the Kabbalistic tradition, and when I did, I found that they didn't just give you like hints to what the geometry was. They actually said, this is the Kabbalistic tree. This is the foundation of all creation, and if you decode this, you'll understand all of the universe. So I knew there that they were giving us a really good key to what was powering the Ark of the Covenant, since the Ark was thought to be the seat of God, the seat of the universe. And the Kabbalistic tree can commonly be described as the tree of knowledge as well, the tree that was placed in the Garden of Eden at the center of our Genesis. So when I looked at it, I thought, what is this? And you know, I started to read Kabbalistic tradition texts and all this. Oh my God, I got so confused. It was so confusing. There's so much stuff out there. And it's all philosophy. And I was really kind of not being able to find anything that was driving, but I was looking at the geometry and what I did is I plastered it on the ceiling of my van so I could lay in my bed and look at it in the morning every morning and I was trying to decode it. And really quickly I realized that the bottom part was a tetrahedron. 
and that the top part was an octahedron. But I didn't know what this middle part was. This this X with a with a box around it. I, I didn't know how to deal with that. And then I realized, wait a minute, this box here, this rectangle, fits in this upper rectangle. So I thought, oh, maybe they just took it and squashed it. So I took the top part and slid the bottom into it. And boom, the result was a tetrahedron and an octahedron on top, which is all of the vertices you need to generate the star tetrahedron with the octahedron in the middle. You guys see this? The only, this, to generate this, all you need is a tetrahedron and an octahedron and all the vertices, and you can start building it. So I was like, oh, this is cool. As soon as you slide the bottom into the top, basically, as soon as you compress it, as soon as you collapse it, right, you obtain a 3D geometry. And then I realized that the Kabbalistic text said that there wasn't just one tree, but that there's four, and that they're attached at the crown or at the root. Well, I assume that they were giving us only half the code again, so that there would be eight trees attached at the root. Well, if there is eight trees attached at the roof, at the root, and each one are decoded to give a star tetrahedron as we just did, then the result is 64 tetrahedron grid. How do you know you've decoded it right? Well, when you're finished, you can actually plot the two-dimensional tree right on top of it and you have all the lines you need with its sephirots. The sephirots are these balls on the corner of the tree. The, the, the word sephirot comes from the word sapphire, referring to crystals. And when you plot the sephirot all around the tree, all around the 64 tetrahedron, since each tree has one sephirot involved in the middle, each tree only has nine sephirots. Nine multiplied by eight, 72. I had come back exactly to the tetragrammaton. And two other ways that you can do this. Mm -hmm. the top three are always considered to be separate and above man, and thus to be mapped separately. Mm -hmm. Center, the center and the crown is in its own space. And the one space that's missing that you have filled in with your dark circle is da'at, known as knowledge. Knowledge, that's right. That point that's the esoteric sephirot in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. I have I have shown this to um, to rubinic Ru tradition expert, and one of them started crying. It's very significant. Uh, <laughs> what scared me is when I was studying this, it warned over and over in many books that if you try to decode the Kabbalistic tree, most people turn crazy. They lose it. <laughs> and I figure, well, you know what? I'm always crazy, so I can't go much further. So I should be all right, right? And so I just um, went at it, and it came out. So I was like in amazement that it was so easy. Now I did do an animation that.
So here it is, again. In this animation, we see the Kabbalistic trees coming together under the generoactive contracting pulses, creating the 64 tetrahedrons of the geometry of space, forming the vector equilibrium at its center. Thank you, Amber. <laughs> and here's a Kabbalistic tree uh, that was generated um, during the time that I was writing this up in a little journal I published. Uh, this was in England. But uh, note on this uh, little animation that um, when we look at it um, slowly, you can see, can everybody see here how the tree actually compress and becomes a 3D object? This is the contractive side of the event horizon, you see?